Hey, welcome back to the NPL Weekly. Becca Scott here with Cedric Phillips and Marshall Sutcliffe. Oh, friends, we are ready to jump into our playoff bracket for the Pearl Division. So, uh, before we do that, let's let's see the head-to-head -head of these two players. We have Carlos Roe Mao and Marcio Carvalho. We just saw Marcio play against Brad Nelson. They're both on Orza Vampires, a bit of a mirror here. And we've got four top finishes for Carlos and eight top finishes for Marcio, both with great records in round robin. So that's why they're on this upper bracket, huh? Well, both these players are great, obviously. One thing I do want to point out very quickly about Marcio, Mr. Second Place. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Serious second place. I mean, the guy, Mr. I don't second want to say he can't close place. because that's a ridiculous thing to say, but he he's, he's even leaning into it on social media now. How often he gets second place. And, you know, second place would be really good here, but not good enough. So. Not good enough yeah. to get you into day two hope, with the championship five. I hope it's not another second place for Marcio. I think he wants to win something. Well, Carlos, his teammate, does not cheer that. Belief. That's true. He hopes to just say go away. Yeah, that's true. And Carl, <laughs> Carlos, you know, a former world champion, he's done a lot of winning in his time playing Magic and has really helped out South American Magic quite a bit. So uh, this mirror should be a lot of fun to watch, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. And you know what? We have a very special couple segments right now. We have interviews. This first one is with Marcio Carvalho with Maria. What's up, beautiful people? Maria here to cover Marcio Carvalho's rise to the top four of the core split. Marcio kicked off his week against Andrew Cuneo, who is one of two competitors not running vampires. It was tricky for Marcio not only because, what do you do here? Attack Narset to make sure you can draw cards with any future champions of Dusk, or just smash face. Carvalho wavered back and forth before deciding that face was the place. And check this out, that's right, that's got Eternal Kefnet in play and a drawn from dreams off the top. Marcio starts off 0-1. Next up, it's what looks like a mirror match against Piotr Gugowski, aka Canister. Marcio doesn't break a sweat, bettering to one and one. Do you like Halloween? Because it's getting pretty spooky in here as Marcio takes on his third opponent, Greg Kowalski on Scape Shift. And it looks like Kowalski might be able to turn the corner here in game one, but nope, Legion's End has something to say about that, wiping out his growing zombie army in one fell swoop. Marcio wins this match to improve to two and one. Marcio's match versus Brad Nelson was actually my favorite of the bunch. We're going to start off in game two with Marcio down a game. Marcio looks like he's behind the eight ball in a big way early on in this game with no cards in hand and only one creature, a Sanctum Seeker. But that will end up being the key to his victory as he manages to keep himself alive and finish Brad off with triggers from Sanctum Seeker and a little help from a flipped Legion's landing. Awesome stuff. But get this, game three is even better. Marcio is stuck on three lands for a long time, but puts up a heck of a fight early. Both players do a lot of thinking this match. Here's a very tricky turn that puts Marcio in what looks to be the driver's seat once again, but not so fast. A pair of Legion's lieutenants for Brad might be the fuel he needs to keep pressure on, with Marcio now at five life. But Marcio has the perfect, flavorful answer in the Legion's end on the two lieutenants, unlocking a tricky attack step and taking down a Johnny. Marcio falls to four the following turn, but now he's got two Sanctum Seekers, and Brad's only got one card in hand. The attack here means six triggers, which will get Marcio to 10 life and Brad to nine. But Brad battles back. His own attack step the following turn swings life totals again 14 to 3, and as we all know, 3 is a very dangerous number when Soren is around, and he was. Brad wins the match in spectacular fashion, which, to be honest, is the vampire way. After his loss to Brad, Marcio is able to rally and take down Christian Hauk, Carlos Romao, and Autumn Burchett. Here's a peek at a quick couple of turns where he goes off with Champion of the Dusk versus Burchett and draws a billion cards. What color draws cards now, Blue? So there you have it, Marcio's road to victory here in the core split, leaving most of the MPL dead, all while staying undead himself. I feel pretty amazing. I thought the deck was great, but I was a little scared. Yeah, I think I have uh, a lot of people didn't play like the big removal. They only played Legion's End, but I think they didn't understand how the mirror works because if you play four Legion's End and no cast downs or Mortifies, you can kill the big creatures, Sentem Seeker, Champion of the Dusk, Vona, I only have one Mortify. But if you can kill the big creatures, you, you're going to lose the game. Even if you deal with the early, early stage of the game. Carlos is a pretty tough opponent. I won against him on the Swiss. 
I don't know if he's going to change decks because now we can change. I don't know even if I'm going to change decks. I have to think about it. But it's going to be a pretty good match for sure. Hello everyone, Corbin Hostler here with a brief recap of how Carlos Romau found himself in the top four. Spoilers, there's going to be a lot of vampires involved. Five of the seven rounds were black-white vampire mirrors as the aggressive deck has shot to the top since the addition of Core Set 2020. Now I can't tell Romau's story without talking about Soren Imperious Bloodlord. The three drop has put vampires back on the map and it gives the deck the flexibility to deal with pretty much anything. That's exactly what it did for Ramal as he navigated his way through five mirrors and won three of them. And it was often Soren that decided the games. Now things got off to a rough start for Ramal as he dropped his first round to Autumn Burchett in the first of many mirror matches to come. But Ramal isn't a former world champion for nothing. The Brazilian rallied immediately, taking down Andrew Cunha's blue black control list in the second round, with Soren, unsurprisingly, standing out as the all star. It dealt the final three points of damage to close out the match just when Cunha was threatening to stabilize with a planeswalker of his own with Liliana. Now that he was on the board, Ramal started to get hot. He rattled off three straight victories, taking out Brad Nelson, Peter Guglowski, and Christian Hauk in three more vampire mirrors. In each win, Ramal leaned on his planeswalkers, usually Soren, but Gideon Blackblade out of the sideboard also came in clutch, especially in a crucial game three against Christian Hauk, where Gideon arrived exactly on time on the third turn and carried Ramal to victory. At four and one, Ramal likely needed just one more win to advance to the top four, but Marcio Carvalho stood in his way. The pair played three extremely tight games, but a critical mirror breaker in Vona proved to be the difference maker for Carvalho as Ramal found himself stuck with a pair of conditional removal spells that couldn't touch the powerful legend. That minute came down to a final match against Gregor's Kowalski and his scapeshift list. Of course, it had to go down to the wire. Ramal took the first game in lightning quick fashion, but Kowalski fought back in game two and slowed the vampires just long enough to resolve a massive scapeshift. Ramal went digging for his answer in Legion's Inn, but even the five cards he drew off Champion of the Dusk weren't enough to get him there, and that meant they were going to a third and final deciding game. Fortunately for Ramal, the third game went exactly according to plan. As Kowalski struggled to ramp his mana, a pair of duress for Ramal cleared the way for his swarm of vampires to carry him to victory and to a berth in the top four. Ah, I'm very, very happy because like uh, it's. Uh, I think my split was one of the toughest ones. So uh, I'm so happy that I could uh, manage to do five twos to, to get five wins uh, and get some mythic points and also be at the top four. Uh, I'm still thinking. Uh, I don't know if I'm gonna change or not. I have. Uh, I, st I still have like a, a little time, but uh, I'm very, very comfortable playing with Vampire. So. I, let's say I'm 99% sure I'm going to play Vampires again, but uh, that 1% maybe during the night can change my mind and then like, I'm just going to wake up at like 3 a.m. and open Arena and try to build something different. But uh, I'm probably going to play Vampires. So uh, like, like, I, I was thinking, like, I, I don't, uh, maybe I'm overthinking too much, so I'm trying to get on, into the, the other player's head see what they are thinking, see, okay, so Cunio is famous for playing with control decks, so is, is he going to play with control decks again? Alto likes to play mid-range aggro decks, so what what's going to happen? You know, Marcio, I know Marcio very well, uh, we test together, we are very, very good friends, so uh, I also, I, I'm thinking, uh, I'm trying to think uh, and see what they are thinking, but uh, I'm, I'm afraid of overthink too much, and then uh, made some mistakes, but uh, I don't know. Like it's, it's gonna be a mind game. It's gonna be very, very fun to try to to be uh, right tomorrow. All right. So Maria talked us through Carvalho's way to the tap, and Corbin talked us through Ramau. And uh, looks like he didn't change his mind. He stuck with the cut. The ninety-nine percenter got there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think it's interesting that both players thought about changing decks, but at the same time, you know, when Did you make they? it through, yeah. yeah, I wasn't really biting. When you make it through, right? It's all, it's so easy to just go. I don't know. This deck is good. And, 
why would I play something else? So they both <laughs> decided to stick with it. It makes sense to me. And there is a real cost to it too, right? After having played that many matches against the high competition, you know the deck really, really well, yeah. switching to something else. I mean, look, look, they can do it. It's not like it's impossible, but got reps with this deck. Yeah, and they're both playing it really, really well. They yeah. actually even ran into each other and they're about to do it again, so this should be yeah. good. Well, this is a mirror, but let's take a look at those deck lists and see uh, if there's any differences here. So here's Carlos Ramel. Taking a look at this, you're gonna find some things that are very obvious. Four Sorns, obviously. Four Dato Vanguards, four Legion Lieutenants, four of the, most of the one drops there. That's all well and good. The numbers that are a little bit interesting here is the one main deck copy of Ajana, the one Vona, and only three Champion of Dusk, where most people play four. And one thing I always like to look at is 714 plus eight is 22, so only 22 lands. You can kinda sort of count Legion's Landing as a land marshal, but you know that they're light on mana, even though they do have some five drops in their deck. Yeah, taking a look at the sideboard, and because one of the things that I wanna look at here carefully are the main deck configuration configuration of removal spells and then what they can shift to out of the board. What are the key cards in the mirror match? Well, we saw Legion's End be good, but mm -hmm. Marcio talked about in his interview about the fact that you need to have Cast Down and Mortify to be able to take care of Champion Dust, Sanctum Seeker, and Vona, and the, just the bigger stuff in general in certain spots. So we don't see a ton of that here from Carlos. Dispark is a nice one to have access to, uh, to go a little bit over the top and take care of some bigger things. And Chupacabra could actually play a role in things as well, a card that is honestly kind of forgotten about. We haven't seen it for a pretty long Long time in this format. I miss him. Don't worry, it's in my vampire deck. <laughs> uh, you're welcome for that tidbit. Here's Carvalho. He didn't take his own advice. He's only got one mortify. So no, this is this is his own advice insofar as he has a way to take care of the big creatures, yes. which is good. And then he's got a couple copies of cast down. So he has enough ways to take care of the big creatures. He also has a fourth champion of Dush and in addition to the bonus. So he's got five five drops where Carlos only has one. He also only has 22 lands just like Carlos as well. This is a much more streamlined version of the deck where we saw some interesting one ofs and two ofs from Carlos. I think Marcio is much happier with his build and his configuration, and his one of his Marshall actually trend towards removal as opposed to Planeswalkers and Creatures. Yeah, we mentioned uh, that Carlos didn't have any cast down. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. yeah, we did see the one copy of Legion's End in the main deck there, and one copy here for Marcio at his board where post board. Uh, Carlos has access to, I believe, four. I believe I it's he's the total four. two and two. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, that, that's a big difference here as well. But otherwise, we see a similar uh, setup here, although I do see those two devout decree in the middle. Exile target creature or planeswalker, that's black. And then there's other words. Scry <laughs> one. And then scry one. Uh, but so he does have some silver bullets here as well. Well, the All thing right. I'll note really quickly, Becca, is just when Marcio was talking in his interview, and not to take anything away from Carlos, obviously, Marcio has very clearly prioritized beating vampires mm. with the Mortify main deck, the Cast Downs main deck, the sideboard configuration as well, uh, and this is really good for this particular matchup. Now, <laughs> the other matchups, we don't know. You know, if, if he runs into Autumn or if he runs into um, Cuneo. Andrew Cuneo, that might not work so well. We'll have to see, but for the mirror and the way that he's approaching things, if I have to pick someone to win, which I guess I do, uh, it, it's hard not to pick Marshall here because it's very clear what he's trying to beat, Marshall. Yes, absolutely, and that is, of course, one of the things we're gonna keep our eye on. That said, this is gonna be close no matter what. Of course. Right, two great players, very similar builds, small edges. Yeah, yeah. You know, definitely. Well, let's jump right in, and then maybe we'll see who's gonna have to face off with some of those decks that are built specifically to take down vampires. Yeah, well, they hope so. <laughs> All right, let's get underway here. So this is the upper part of our bracket here. The winner is gonna advance to the next round. Remember, we are playing double elimination. So even if uh, one of the, the player who loses this match is not eliminated, they just have to dump, uh, jump down to the uh, lower bracket. So, ugh. And Mulligan is a little, already. This is a little, oh, this is already a mole. Yeah, and Oof. you, I don't. Oof. Look, I, I don't think you can keep this hand. I really don't. You can play one Knight of the Ebony Legion and then hope that you find another mana, a white mana, then you're kind of off to the races. But that window is very narrow, and he's going to send that back. Well, at least you can keep this one. <sighs> right? I mean, you're keeping this one? Okay. You're probably putting away a cast down at Legion's End. Maybe just both cast downs. Okay, sure. Okay, so the thought process here, if you're Marcio, by putting both cast downs down, is a way for me to get card advantage back is by legions ending something that you draw drawn multiple copies of. Mm -hmm. And so I actually kind of like this idea. Now the Sorn in the Champion of Dusk isn't going to be great and we'll see how Sorn will be used once we get to that point. But I like the idea of, and this is awesome, oh, because brutal. this actually works. Yes. Which is legions <laughs> end this crappy creature, you drew one of these and now I've undone a little bit of your advantage. So that's actually really, really big for Marcio to have that happen. Okay, so we're getting right back into it here, but of course, Carlos gets to keep curving out another copy of Sora, not what he wants to see here, though I suppose you just put the champion into play. 
It will be the biggest thing on the battlefield, and you'll get a card back out of it. Yeah, this is fantastic. So champion is better yeah. than Adato Vanguard in combat, obviously, 3-1 versus 4-4. Four, four. Mm -hmm. So you're protecting your Sorn, and if your Sorn gets killed, you have a backup Sorn. So this is weirdly... Really good. Going well. <laughs> How is this happening? On a mulligan to five. <laughs> yeah. Not you got your two for bad. one Legion's End. You have your champion Dusk and Soren on the battlefield. Soren is arguably the best card in game number one. You know what your opponent's working with because of the Legion's End, so you know about the Legion's Landing, the Legion's End, and the Soren. You don't know about the Vanguard in hand, but who cares about that realistically? This is actually going really well for Marcio, Marshall. Insane. He can now play. Well, let's see, actually see what he wants to do. He has a copy of Soren of his own, Dis Carlos. He can use that to pump up the Adanto Vanguard and try to get it through, but he's not going to. He's going to take the longer route, probably looking to transform that Legion's Landing a little bit down the line by playing these two creatures. A Swamp off the top here, and uh, not a ton of action left. Yeah, your one Legion's End, unfortunately for you, Marcio, is already in the graveyard. He would love to have access to another copy of that right now, but it is not to be. So land number four, he's going to have to settle for. And what is he doing? Just shields him up? Yeah, I mean, maybe this is just a plus and put this here. Um, uh, maybe an attack? I would maybe be a little bit surprised. We'll see. Okay, so what this is is basically I'm attacking you for five. There's a little bit of lifelink action here. But more importantly, if you do want to do some blocking, like, like, let's say with the Adanto Vanguard, okay, then sure, you have to pay four life. So either way, I'm dealing damage. And I don't really mind if I lose my Soren here. That's not the end of the world because I have a backup copy. This is also pointing out and reiterating what Marcio talked about in his little interview segment that we just saw a little bit ago, which was you need to diversify your removal to take care of the big creatures. Look at the Legion's End. That is not lining up with the Champion of Dusk. It had to be a Mortify. It had to be a Cast Down. Uh, the way we'd be calling this game would be much different. By the way, I'm looking at the deck list, and apparently Marcio does actually have two Legion's End main and one sideboard. So he does okay. have one, one floating around in that library somewhere, just to correct myself there. In the meantime, plan A for Carlos, apparently get that Adanto the first fort online, and that's what he's done here. While doing so, bye-bye Soren. Now what? Nothing, he's just gonna start making one ones. Okay. And make hay while the sun's shining, as they say in the business. Not a lot going on here, though. For Marcio, he does have access to a, the second copy of Soren, and still has the 5-5 five -five champion of Dusk. But how can he get out of this? So I don't think deploying the second. So I don't think deploying that sword in hand does anything. You know, you plus on champion dusk and then yeah. it just dies, right? And then it dies. So I, I don't think there's any reason for Marcio to do that. And if he was going to do it, he was going to do it pre-combat. So I think he's going to hold it. We're going to see Carlos activate the Adanto. And eh, okay, tender a block, sure. Pass the turn back. That's totally fine. But I, I, if you're if you're Marcio, your best draw right now is champion of dusk. And that's going to ideally chain you into more things. But now you have to worry about the sword that's coming from Carlos's side. And there it is. Soren Imperius Bloodlord hits the battlefield. No more Adanto the First Fort action here for Carlos. And he's going to get frisky. Leaving back the Adanto Vanguard on blocks. He also gets to follow up with Sky Marcher Aspirin. Big turn there for Ramal. Love leaving the Adanto Vanguard back on defense. If you're going to protect your Soren in this game because it's the best thing that's going on now on Carlos' side of the battlefield, that's a great creature to do it with. You already know that Marcio is resource light and looks to be flooding a little bit there. And in combination with the Sky Marcher Aspirant being back on defense as well, if you're Carlos, you have to assume you're going to get to use your Soren next turn again. Mulligan to five here for Carvalho and a good start, but it does seem to have flattened out for him a bit as Ramau has taken control of this game. And the tough thing too is if you're if you're Marcio, you know that your opponent has Legion's End in hand, so as good as a draw as Knight of the Ebon Legion is with mana available, you know it's just gonna die mm -hmm. to the Legion's End. So there's nothing too crazy going on with that card. So you're hoping your champion and Vest can stand tall, but in the face of a Soren that's granting lifelink and death touch, uh, the chances of that are pretty slim. Right, really, really good combo, of course, with the Danto Vanguard, giving it lifelink plus the ability to pay the four life and make it indestructible, and Death Touch means it's just not really a card you can interact with in combat in any meaningful way. I think where this starts for this game is you're going to see Marcio deploy Soren now and make... What, what he's doing here is he's going to force Carlos to probably play a sub-game, which is you need to divert your attention to that Soren because it is powerful enough to take over the game. But what I think if you're Marcio, what you're thinking is, is I'm going to play the Knight, most likely, and you're going to Legion's End it. Okay, sure, let's get that exchange over with and probably play the land because if I'm Marcio, my hope is that I draw into 
Champion of Dusk, mm -hmm. and I draw two cards, and maybe it's land plus Legion's End, mm. kill those Adanto Vanguards. You have to start playing for stuff like that when you're on the mulligan here. You also need to hope your opponent draws a whole lot of lands. Right, and that is exactly what Carlos has for the turn here, but that, of course, is permanent number 10, so the Aspirant is now in the air. And a second copy of Legion's Landing hits the battlefield, producing another token. And it looks like we're just going to go upstairs. No, we're going to actually just use it as a removal spell on Night of the Ebon Legion. This lets Carlos keep Legion's End in hand as well. And it leaves Marcio blockerless. The other nice thing that this Ooh. allows too is you get a little transformation there. You have, that means you have enough mana to activate a Danto. The first fort once again, so that's actually a really nice turn. Beautiful, beautifully played here by Carlos Romao. You can see the fruits of his patience now. Look at the board stage just as a snapshot. Sure, there's a 6-6, six, six. that's a nice big creature for Marcio, but it's Planeswalker, a whole bunch of creatures. Adanto, the first fort's gonna pump out a chump blocker here, and things looking really good for Carlos Romao here in game number one. The positives are very small here for Marcio. If you're rooting for Marcio here and you're trying to figure out how he gets back in this game, again, I'm gonna mention Champion of Dusk and maybe Sanctum Seeker, maybe, but we've seen how ineffective Sorn is right now and the Mortify that Carlos has just drawn means that this game is almost certainly over because the only thing he didn't have an answer to was the 6-6 and he just found one. There you go. And he's gonna go ahead and hit the red zone here. This is a huge attack, 7-11 damage coming in. Bang, 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 and down to five goes Marcio Carvalho. And Ramal can just sit here and pass the turn back because, well, that's gonna do it for game number one. Marcio is going to concede game number one, so Carlos does win that game. Mulligan to five there for Marcio. He was competitive in that game with the Champion of the Dusk and the Soren. Felt like he might be able to actually get a little something going there, but wasn't able to. So now we go to the sideboards. And you know, in spots like this, you see them sideboard out some number of one mana creatures, but this deck is built around one mana creatures. You're not gonna sideboard out Knight of the Ebon Legion. You're gonna leave Sky March or Aspirant in in some numbers because it can have flying and that's a way for you to break a stall. So having that stuff in there is pretty good, but it feels like for both players, it's just gonna be light sideboarding, Marshall. I don't expect to see a ton change here, personally. Some massaging, if you will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're not gonna see gigantic shifts like you'd see from maybe like a Simic Nexus deck in this sure, matchup. Sure, sure. We're know. in the mirror, you know what cards are important, in, in most situations, that's Soren. Other situations will be Champion of Dusk. There are games that Vona will win by itself or Soren Vengeful Bloodlord here. But for the most part, your deck's gonna stay somewhat similar. Yeah, it looks like he's only made small changes. But the thing that's really interesting about this matchup to me is just the swinging nature of it. We, we saw it when we watched Brad play against Marcio earlier in the broadcast of just what can happen with all these lifelink triggers and life totals going up and down and all around. And we actually just saw in that last game where there are spots where Soren is unbelievable and there were spots where Soren was like, I didn't even want to cast this this turn. Right, literally just pass the turn back. Yeah. So it's a, it's a little wild in the vampire mirror. Where do the vampires live, do we know? Uh, the Legion? Yeah, they're, they're, Adanto, they? I guess? That's, a, that's their yeah, home? Yeah, Is that their home? Yeah, yeah. yeah. They started it a while ago with just a, a fort. Yeah. <laughs> I hate that I'm laughing. <laughs> really, really, ooh, really bad. <laughs> uh, ooh, wow, that is way too expensive of a hand. He's got five double fours and another five there with just the one land. Rough. And Marcio... Really having a tough go here with these mulligans. This one looks like a keep, but not super powerful. I mean, this is a hand that can play magic, so you yeah. know, you'll you'll take that. You've got three lands, yeah. too, in case you do draw Soren, so you're okay with that. Which lands do you want to keep? Because you're obviously putting a land back here. You know, is there upside to keeping Goblet Shrine as opposed to keeping the planes? That's for him to decide. He decided to put the planes on the bottom, keep Goblet Shrine in the hand, and this is a totally fine hand here for... Uh, for Carlos. Yeah, just another okay hand, right? I mean, we have seen that the Vampire's deck does have a nut draw that is really tough to interact with. Mm -hmm. and like, if you don't interact, you're just dead. Ooh. But that's not the case here. That is bold. What did he do? Put a land on the bottom? Ooh. Crazy man. Ooh. He's got a five drop in his, I guess he's just gonna plan on Soarin'ing, okay. But he, but, he put the but he put the third land on the bottom, yeah. I'm hoping to draw, and he drew another sword. Oh, the oh punish, no, oh no. <laughs> your punishment might be rather uh -oh. severe, Carlos. There could be some justice incoming Ooh. here. 
I, I would have just put the one drop away. It's a vicious conquistador. I mean, he, trust me, Carlos is a million times better than me, but this feels a little risque. All right, well, we'll see how it pans out for him. Knight of the Ebon Legion is a follow-up play here for Carvalho oh, before boy. passing it, and there's Legion Lieutenant. Oh, boy. Tick-tock, one more turn for Carlos to find line number three and really kind of explode. If he does, though, assuming that it's an untapped land, he will be in good shape. And, yeah, it will be an untapped, so he... Does need to find it though. Yes, he does. But part of the reason I wanted to keep the third land is because I want to draw the fourth land to cast Chupacabra. Mm. Obviously, Soren casting Soren is awesome, but I'm so interested in actually hard casting Chupacabra on time this game. You might need to do that, and that is looking sort of unlikely at the moment. We'll have to see what the draw step is, but risky business from the former world champion. Risky biz indeed. Legion Lieutenant's gonna hit the battlefield for Carvalho, which opens up an attack with both of his creatures. So a good aggressive start for him, plus a trigger on the knight. And is it a land? Mm. Of course it is. That's how you become a world <laughs> champion. That's how you get in the MPL. Land off the top of the library. Soren Imperious Bloodlord is gonna put Champion of Dusk on, that's three cards going into hand now for Ramal, though his life total has fallen down to 11. You and I wouldn't have drawn the land. No, absolutely <laughs> not. No, we wouldn't have drawn the land. Now no, everything's perfect. V Vona. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everything is, everything is perfect for Carlos now. You gotta go after this Sorn. You have to get this thing off of the battlefield, or at least try to. Knight of the Admiral Legion can, of course, grow with the activated ability, make it into a 6-7 with Death Touch. And, you know, it looks like Carlos is saying, you know what, Sorn has done its job. I've got a backup copy anyway, so I don't even need this. Legion's End isn't bad here, but the tough thing, if I'm Marcio, is I just saw that hand, and I'm just <laughs> like, oh, boy. <laughs> uh, there's Vona off the top of the library for him now. He will have to wait a turn. Unless he wants to put it in with Soren, but things looking very good for him to just stabilize this board by playing Ravenous Chupacabra and taking the most powerful threat off the other side of the battlefield. And now, not only does he have the long game really on lockdown, mm -hmm. he's just ahead. I mean, not even interested in attacking with champion. No, he's, he's at just 11. gonna leave it back. And if I'm if I'm Carlos, depending on what the draw step is, my thought process is now let's use all of our mana every turn. Yep. So last turn we play Chupacabra, right? And next turn we play land, we play Vona. Next turn after that, if we draw a land, we go Soren and have Mortify available. Let's just use all of our land every single turn, cast all of our spells because we have such an advantage. And now you've seen Marcio play his last card. His last card of this match, potentially Carlos Ramal up a game over him and just played Vona, Butcher of Magan, and game? Close. It's it's close. I mean, with the mortifying hand, mortifying storm. I mean, that's that that's a heck of a one-two punch for the following Ugh. turn and another mortify. Oh, double mortify plus the land it casts both. All right, I'm willing to call it or close to it now. Yeah, it looks like Carlos from Mao is going to advance again. I will remind you, this is double elimination. We are not eliminating anybody this opening round here in our upper bracket. But uh, if it is Marcio that ends up losing this game, which it certainly looks like the case, he will be up against it. Yeah. He can he cannot lose another match or he's out of our top four and will not be advancing to the top sixteen at the Mythic Championship. Mortify at the ready, and it's a card that Marcio knows about. So any double blocks that you're thinking about tendering here, it's a no-go. Your Legion Lieutenant is gonna get blown up in combat potentially, or your Knight of the Evan Legion. And I love the attack because there's really not a good block because of the Mortify that's hanging out here. That's right. So. Is he gonna activate Vona as well? Yes, he is. Yep. Post attack to activate, you get a rebate. You pay seven life up front to take out a potential blocker, but since it has lifelink, he'll get four of that back and put it back up to 11. And that's a nice thing. And the text on that card is very, very important too. Nice legions on, by the way. The text on that card is really important because it's activated no during- No target. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> because it's activated during your turn, not activated sorcery speed. Yes. So the fact that you can attack and then activate to mess up blocks and That's then get right. your life back is really, really nice. Uh, that Legion's end off Horrible. the top. Marcio must just be like, come on, everything has gone terribly for him. It's felt like Carlos has had it all this game, and he has. Yep. He doesn't even know about the second Mortify either. Not that it looks like it's going to be particularly relevant here because Vona can keep doing Vona things, although at this point it looks like Carlos is content to just attack and just sort of dare Marcio to block, which he really can't do. He goes down to four, and we could just see another Vona activation just to clear away really any chance here for Marcio to come back. He's now down to one Vicious Conquistador. Devout Decree would have been good a few turns ago. At this point, though, Way too late. Ah, uh, yes, in the infamous words of Natalie and Brugula, you're a little late. <laughs> I'm already torn. <laughs> <laughs>
that's what I bring to the broadcast. I see, it's I bad. see. I know it's our first time doing this. Yeah. I bring bad pop, uh, pop culture okay. to the broadcast. And it looks like the GG incoming here from Marcio Carvalho because Carlos Ramau wins his opening round here and uh, takes that one big step closer to the big prize here. We're in the Pearl Division and we are fighting it out to see who gets to advance to day two, which is, by the way, a top 16 finish at the Mythic Championship. Which Absolutely. is a huge deal as yeah. we saw when we were all in Vegas. We watched Brad Nelson use that, just that pass into day two. To stroll his way on in. Yeah, stroll, just strolled oh. on in for day number two of competition with Brian Brondon and a couple others. Yeah. And then strolled on in to day number three and into the finals before, unfortunately for him, losing in the finals. But that is a huge step forward for Carlos. We see vampires, of course, moving forward because it was going to move forward in one of those players' hands. And you just see the swinging natures of the games. Um, Soren can have such a huge impact on things. Legion's end can have such a huge impact on things. But the back and forth nature makes the matchup very interesting. But at the end of the day, back up, that deck that you love is very powerful. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful deck. But is this going to be an uphill battle now that he has to play uh, either the Feather deck or the Mono Red? Yeah, a little bit. At, le yeah. at least uh, on an incline, right? <laughs> it, 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 I mean, it's not It's not like it's one of those matchups that can't be won, yep. but yeah. you got to work for it. Definitely. Yeah, but that's, right. that's the appeal of Vampires. It's Even though these decks are trying to go beat it very quickly, they can still win. And that's what makes the deck very appealing, is that as good as your deck is trying to be against it, they can just do something awesome with Sorn and put Champion and play Ervonia and play and just win the game that way. So even though I think that Cuneo and Autumn have brought great decks to the table, they can still lose. Absolutely. All right, now we have a winner interview, as it says. Now we know that it's Carlos Romo. So let's see what Carlos has to say. All right, hello, I'm Paul Chion, joined here by the winner of the upper finals match. I'm here with former world champion Carlos Romo. How's it going? Very well, very well. And you? Yeah, I'm, I'm doing well. And you guys, both of you, submitted the same Vampires deck. I know players had the chance to kind of resubmit their decks after locking in the top four. What kind of made you choose to kind of run it back? Yeah, so uh, I decided, like, I don't know Mars thought process, but I decided to stay with Vampires. Like, I was, I was trying to, I was, like, overthinking the whole night. I, like, I was like, <laughs> come on. So what Andrew going to do? So what Mars you going to do? So what uh, Autumn going to do? And then, like, Oh, they got they gotta build like something against vampires. I'm pretty sure they gotta <laughs> come here and like control decks, yeah, stack it with like uh, mass removals, spot removals, blah blah. I was like overthinking all the night. I I I try like uh, field of ruins. I played some matches with some other decks, Greeks and everything else. But I said no, no vampires is so good. Like vampires is so hard to deal with. Like uh, even if you prepare against, like even if you try to to break the deck, the deck's so good because the deck's aggressive. The deck has like card advantage with the champion. The deck has a story that like it's a machine. Uh, it's removal. It's a uh, pumps your creature. It allows you to uh, get tempo playing like uh, fat creatures on turn three. So it's so hard to deal with that I I, I understand like okay I'm going with vampires. I think vampires is the best deck right now on on uh, standard. So I, I stay with uh, the vampires and then I just. I made a few changes, so I can like I think I was I had a better chance on the top four. Well, speaking of which, you know, now that you're kind of locked into the finals here, uh, and you know, you've already gotten the opportunity to play against Marcio's list. You know, we have Andrew Cuneo bringing the Boros Feather deck and Autumn Burchett's mm -hmm. Mono Red deck. Kind of, yeah. I think I think I think the, the Mono Red decks kind of uh, it's better to play because like uh, I don't have to play around a lot of stuff. You know, uh, I, there's like no pump spells. There is no. I don't have to be concerned about Feather and then Feather going crazy, drawing like a lot of cards on the same turn, uh, yeah, doing multiple instants and then coming back to the head and stuff like that. So I I I I'm I, I'm rooting for for Adam and I'm rooting for the Mono Red to get into Marsu and actually I I'm, I'm not gonna lie I'm rooting for Marsu to meet me at the final so we can uh, rematch because like Marsu is a good friend of mine uh, we test together for all the tournaments we are always talking uh, uh we I stay at his house uh, before Barcelona so uh, we get along very very well and I'm uh, I'm really rooting for Marsu but uh. Uh, I think it's, it's going to be an easier job for Marcio if the Mono Red plays against him. All right, Carlos. Well, best of luck in the finals. Yeah. Thanks so much, and, Paul. And uh, we'll toss it back to the desk.
Well, thank you, Paul. What a nice guy. Pre-recorded Paul, yeah. Just, just slaps him out of here, says, get out of here, Marcio, but I'm rooting for you. But yes. I love you, man. Yeah. Uh, the friendship is beautiful. All right. And that vampire hype is strong. That yeah. was a long segment just talking about his love of vampires. He loves it. Which yeah. I can understand. Yeah, it's, it's a great, beautiful, beautiful deck. It's a great deck. <laughs> All right. Now we want to tell you about how you can watch other matches played in the Round Robin Tournament earlier this week if you go to magic.gg. You can check it all out there. Check out the new features in the Magic Esports site. Find full rosters and results from every match in the core split, which is a new thing for this split. Now, each match has a VOD, which you can see right there. You can see how they load Carvalho versus Hawk right there. And uh, dive into what your favorite players did during the core split. Check it all out. It's at magic.gg. I don't know if that stands for good game, but that's what I assume. It's almost certainly standing for One good game. One would What would anyone, GG doesn't mean anything else. No. Does not. Good, I don't good, think there's good. a good. country that starts with two Gs. Glorious. Not that I know of. Well. I'm gonna start one. <laughs> <laughs> it's called Good Game. Yeah. Well, 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 well you work game. on that. I guess you and you and Ben Stark can talk about that because I'm getting I'm getting pushed out of the booth here, huh? Oh well, don't worry about that. That's true. We will have Ben Sp Stark in the expert seat. But first, we gotta go to a quick break. <laughs> 